Welcome to Curbside Chat. I'm your host, Lorraine Sommerfeld. This webcast is brought to you by the Automotive Industries Association of Canada, AIA Canada. It's a chance for our experts who are on the ground to find out what's going on within the industry. Today we're going to handle a true hot potato of a topic, the right to repair. I'm joined by Alana Baker. She's AIA Canada's VP of Government Relations and Research, and Emily Chung, who is owner of Auto Niche as well as being a licensed technician. Welcome both. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Alana, I'm going to ask you right out of the gate to set a little bit of groundwork here. Right to repair, it's a phrase many of us are familiar with, but it is not what it used to be. Where are we at right now in Canada when it comes to right to repair? Oh, yes, loaded question. <laughs> um, I mean, of course, I will speak to right to repair as it relates to the uh, auto auto care industry and vehicles. But when when you think about, when people think and hear the words right to repair, you know, I usually liken it to a cell phone. Um when you have, for example, a particular phone who that's, needs repair or is broken, you bring it to um, a shop and they tell you, actually, we can't fix this because it's, you know, we don't have the uh, proper tools or materials or information or data to actually fix it. Cars are exactly the same. Vehicles today are computers on wheels. They are connected to the internet at all times. And as technology evolves, the cars today are not like they were um, that we you know, have seen over the past several years. They're collecting an abundance of data that is required to actually maintain, service, and repair your vehicle. All of this data um, today is transmitted wirelessly directly to the vehicle manufacturers. Um, and all of that data is, is needed to properly diagnose, service, and repair a vehicle. And at issue today is a consumer's um, ability and choice to bring their vehicle to um, the repair shop of their choice is at risk because the manufacturers are controlling how that data is accessed and who has access to it. Okay. Emily, Alana's laid out some of the changes which have been enormous. Yeah. What are the challenges you're seeing on the shop floor? Because you're right there. Yeah, so for us, like there's the issue is so multi-layered. So Alana touched on the access to the data, which is one piece. The other piece for us as technicians is a service manual. So the actual procedures of how to repair things, what what data am I actually looking for in terms of an output at a sensor, like those kind of technical information that we need to have in order to diagnose and repair, maintain these vehicles. So there's it's definitely multi layered in terms of you know the um, access to information piece for us so traditionally would you be able to fix pretty much anything that came into the shop <laughs> because you had access to <clears throat> this information yeah traditionally we could and like we still can right for the most part we can still service many of the vehicles that are on the road today I think we are looking ahead because mm. you know time passes quick and so for us we we could traditionally do there's a few things there was more information available to us previously right for the the other uh, models of vehicles the other thing, though, is that manufacturers have, by and large, agreed on an overall system set up for an internal combustion engine, which we don't see in the electric vehicle market, right? Manufacturers for EVs, they can set it up however which way they would like. And so there's no standard, you know, um, I guess, guideline of how they're making these yet. So that's part of the challenge as well. Alana, is legislation failing us? Is this a big part of the problem? Uh, it's a huge part of the problem. <laughs> um, you know, right to repair uh, is critical in this industry for a number of reasons, particularly affordability, uh, accessibility, um, uh, competition. Uh, you know, competition is a is a good thing, um, but it needs to be on a fair and level playing field. Um, and what we have today um, is not enough, frankly, um, to allow consumers um, the ability to choose where uh, they service their vehicle. Um, we currently have a voluntary agreement, and there are a number of flaws with that agreement. First of all, it's, it's um, <coughs> outdated. It's nearly 15 years old. Um, it is voluntary, so there's no enforcement mechanism in place. Um, and participants are not mandated to, to even be part of that agreement. Um, and it applies to outdated technology, as I think you know we spoke to earlier, the cars are not the way that they were in the past, right? So um, we now have updated technology and our laws need to be brought up to date to reflect the wireless world that we are now, um, you know, that we are now living in. Um, so we are looking for standalone legislation that will give consumers the right 
um, to take their vehicle where they want to want to take it. And I will say that Canadians support legislation. 94% of Canadians think that they should have the choice on where they bring their vehicle. And 83% of Canadians believe that manufacturers should be required by law to make this uh, data um, available. I think people whine about red tape all the time, but red tape is regulation. It's right. safety. Right. And they want to know which restaurants they can go to. They want to know that who is maintaining their car hits those standards. So I think when we see red tape, that's kind of a false flag, I think, sometimes. And when you, your numbers indicate that people really do want this legislation in, pay, in place. Well, they do. And if I could just add, I mean, I think a vehicle is, um, for the vast majority of Canadians, the second biggest purchase that you will make. And for some, it's it's the biggest purchase mm-hmm. that you will make. Um, so, you know, they are looking at this as, as an investment and they deserve to have the choice and be able to be confident that they are able to um, again, to get their vehicle service when they need to, especially, you know, without um, um, the ability to have, uh, you know, to access independent auto care service and repair, especially in rural and remote locations, um, a consumer's ability to have access to this, to this uh, um, you know, uh, essential and affordable service is going to be compromised. And it's it's about the people, right? It's not just about the consumers. You think about the single parent who's on a budget, um, their car breaks down, they don't have a way to get to work, they don't have a way to get the kids to school, they don't have a way to get to their groceries because their shop, their local shop down the street doesn't is not unable to, to service Can't their... Repair. Yeah, so yeah. what did they do? Yeah. Um, it's a challenge. And then the people on the other side, you know, those who are actually employed uh, at, these, at these shops, people have invested their livelihoods into mm-hmm. these cornerstones of their communities mm-hmm. um, and their jobs are now at risk. Emily, mm-hmm. you, you touched on the changing technologies with electric vehicles. Yeah. We've seen a lot of startup electric companies that yep. are not Ford, not GM, yep. not Tesla. A lot of them aren't going to be here mm-hmm. in a few years. I think we know that. How is that going to impact your ability if they don't come to the table sooner? Like, There's a reason they all need to be. Yeah. So we, in part of our industry, the, the interesting thing is there's so much talk and fanfare about automotive technology and innovation and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And very rarely... Very rarely do I ever see the installers or the technicians um, part of that conversation because you can build a product and that's fine, but if there's nobody around to fix it and maintain it, and, and again, to Lana's point, a lot of times these are expensive you know, investments or purchases for consumers, right? And so it's not like you know, they're going to be replacing it. You know, if, it, if it fails, that they'll just go and get a new one. Um, we have um, been working with, so my, my shop, we've been working with a, um, a company out of the U.S. that basically converts um, the vehicles into an EV powertrain. And we are an authorized service center for them we get direct access to their um you know oem information and they're they're super cooperative with with us which is great because for them it's not sustainable to have like a traditional dealership model right prior to uh, engaging in services with us they would fly their technicians out from colorado every single time just to um, service and maintain one of their fleets so from that end too it's not sustainable and so I think that they, we will start seeing a lot of these startups, if they're really serious about it and they're here for the long term, they'll, they will engage the independent side to be able to be that sort of um, service center for, authorized service center for them. Well, it's going to be in their best interest as well. Absolutely, because yeah. how do you sell a product to which nobody can maintain or repair? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Alana, Quebec is the head of the curve on this. Can you speak a little bit about what they're doing and whether you think the rest of the country should be considering what they're doing? For sure. Um, yes. It, I mean, great point. Quebec has, as you said earlier, right, we are we are pushing for legislation because consumers deserve to be protected by legislation. Quebec has taken a big step forward um, here in Canada. And I want to be clear that we are pushing for legislation at the national level. Um, we do need to have federal legislation in place um, to avoid a patchwork, right, especially with the interconnected nature of, of the supply chain when it comes to vehicles. Um, however, like I said, Quebec has taken a big step forward um, and it sets precedence for, for other jurisdictions to follow, um, both at the provincial level and at the federal level. They did introduce a bill, um, Bill 29, which is um, an act to protect consumers um, from planned obsolescence and also promote the repairability, 
durability and maintenance of goods, including vehicles, which is obviously the big piece, right? We we can have a leg- piece of legislation, but if vehicles are not included, then it's not gonna it's not gonna help us. Um, so vehicles are included. What it does is it proposes to uh, amend the Consumer Protection Act, um, which among other things would allow for or mean that we have to have uh, information, um, tools, service materials available um, for purchase at a reasonable price for the purposes of repair and maintenance um, for the by the vehicle driver or the vehicle repairer. But it also goes further and would mandate vehicle manufacturers to um, allow access um, to, to the vehicle's data. Um, so in, that's going through the process right now. Um, we are anticipating that um, it will move um, quickly. Um, and like I said, it, do, it does set uh, uh, precedence for, for others to, f- to follow suit. And it is a signal to the federal government that we are moving on this. Alana, you mentioned federally. Is there any federal initiatives that are of interest? So there is currently uh, a federal bill before government, Bill C-244. Um, it is a private member's bill. Um, and what that bill proposes to do is amend the Copyright Act um, to allow the circumvention of technological protection measures for the purposes of diagnosis, maintenance, and repair. Um, this is a, it's a step in the right direction, um, but it's not the entire solution. Um, but, you know, this is the avenue by which government is Uh, studying the right to repair. We are certainly engaged um, in the process. We've testified before committee. Um, We are meeting with governments from across all all sides um, to ensure that vehicles are included in this legislation. Um, It is moving slowly slowly through Parliament. Um, But like I said, more needs to be done, um, which is why we are pushing for standalone legislation that ensures that, um, you know, the data is available um, and that consumers ultimately have choice on where they bring their, their car for service and repair. Is there any other governments in the world that are getting this right? Anyone that's ahead of us? So right to repair is um, a global movement, and we are seeing it happening all over the world. This is not unique to Canada. Um, you know, we're seeing it, of course, in the United States, um, at both at the state level. Massachusetts was a big one um, that recently passed legislation overwhelmingly. Um uh, they also introduced legislation at the federal level now in the United States, but we're also seeing it in other areas. Australia is another really good example um, where they recently passed legislation. Just it came into effect last uh, last summer, summer of 2022, um, and that again um, it allows for um, vehicle service repair and information to be available for purchase at a reasonable cost. And it's you know almost like a one stop shop. I think a lot of the concern that we have is um, you know they we don't want to have to go to 12, 15, 20 different sources to get the information you need, right? And mm-hmm. all of the, you know, what I just spoke to, both Quebec, Australia, that allows for, again, allows our small and medium-sized businesses to compete on a fair and level playing field, but it also, again, protects consumers and gives them gives them choice. Emily, I think a lot of times consumers hear words like right to repair and they tune this out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not, it's, it's just words and they don't know. Their car gets dinged or they need an oil change or an EV not yeah. an oil change they just go and do it they don't consider how important this is how how do you what would you like consumers to know what would you like them to ask what do you want them to be more aware of and how do we get that information out I think by and large uh, right now what I see happening in our industry from the shop owner side is when we cannot fix a vehicle because we don't have access to the information so this is specifically from my end the technical information um, because I can I can read the sensor in the car and it's outputting a certain amount right but I have no technical info to say is this good bad or, or anything so when we don't have access to the technical info a lot of us right now say oh you know what you need to return to the dealership and that's sort of have been the band-aid solution for our customers um, is go back to the dealership. But in terms of a long-term sustainability issue, that's not going to be, it's, it, it just cannot happen long-term wise, right? And so for the consumers, I think what they need to remember is that just because they can fix the vehicle now today and they have the choice to go to whichever um, repair shop that they want to, doesn't mean that that's going to be the case in a few years time, especially if they continue to hold back information for service technicians. So in that case, you won't be able to go to the place that you want. You will be then forced to wait in line, wait in queue to, you know, the dealership and when their next availability is. And it just significantly limits the choice that they have. Alana, what role does AIA Canada have in this? We've 
just heard from Emily that consumers are going to be severely restricted in choice. You've touched on that as well. Do we need better political pressure? Do we need more messaging? What's your role in this? Yeah, excellent question. Um, so, so many reasons, like like we just said, like Emily just mentioned. So affordability, this is a true pocketbook issue uh, for Canadians, uh, right? All I hear about these days is how we can't afford to even buy uh, groceries, right? So um, affordability is big. Accessibility, I do want to point out that even, you know, the, the dealerships are not even going to be able to meet the demand, right? There's not enough um, capacity to meet the demand that, that we're going to see. I think Emily also mentioned electric vehicles um, earlier. All of those that are coming onto our roads, um, we are going to have to be able to have enough, um, you know, people to be able to fit, service and repair those vehicles. Um, and then again, competition, um, you know, with, without competition, it, it hurts our economy and it drives, drives prices up. And consumers should be able to, you know, call around, find what what's um, most convenient for them, what's affordable to them, and be able to shop around and pick what works for them. All of those pieces are important, and I think that um, it's not just about ensuring fair competition, but it's about, um, you know, protecting and preserving consumer choice um, and ensuring that they continue to have access to reliable, essential, and affordable vehicle service and repair. And this is... You know where we come in as an association you know we need to be able to continue getting that message out um, so that they understand you know lawmakers and policymakers understand that this is a real uh, issue for Canadians um, we you know we are not going to be successful if we don't have a rallying of support from industry at the local grassroots level um, and that's where we need um, everyone to you know to, to join our fight and so we've actually um, launched um, a tool recently the link will be in the show notes um, to become a, a grassroots champion what that means is you're willing to uh, promote our right to repair message to um, to governments to the public um, to the media um, to say that we need change um, and we need we need change now and I would remind them you know members who speak up get heard by policymakers and they can positively uh, affect change mm -hmm. um, but again we we need support you know it's going to take an entire a commitment from the entire industry yeah. um, to get this done and a strong dose of perseverance i think to both of you when we've touched on it in notes is there's probably going to be an exodus from this industry of skilled experienced workers leaving mm -hmm. because the change is, it's a sea change as far as what you're repairing and how you're repairing it. So it's almost like AIA Canada has to be, tra they have to transplant a cactus. Like, how do you do this? Because you've got so many moving parts right. in this equation. So your work's cut out for you. Uh, <laughs> and the point about, you know, the, the labor, I mean, we talk about labor shortages all the time in our trade. And I think the concern too is that, I look at the other end too. Yes, we do have the the piece moving for the consumer side, but for the technician side, for the labor side, if I don't have access to the information, how could I possibly train the technicians? You know, and so there's it's amplified in terms of the issue. You're not lo you're no longer going to have automotive service technicians. What you're going to have is product specialists of just a particular manufacturer, right? Because they have been trained at the dealer level, or they've been able to get access uh, to information specifically for that brand. But let's say you know if they decide as a technician, I work for um, I don't know, let's pick Ford, and I decide I don't want to work for Ford anymore. Well, my only option if I've if I've only been trained on that particular product then. And and there's no uniform design of EVs, let's say, is I go to another Ford dealership and it's just not realistic. Like how many Ford dealerships are there in any given geographical mm -hmm. area? You know, and then just when I think about the amount of training and development that needs to happen for us to know each and every single um, product, you know, it, it can be done um, and we need access to the information though. So just from the labor side, uh, skilled trade side, it, there's a whole bunch of you know competing issues there too. Do you think there would be pushback though, like for a dealer, hey, you can only bring it to me. So is there kind of a conflicting? Let's be very honest. The dealers are gonna be more than busy with all of the recalls that they need to do. So they will be just fine. Um, and as a technician working for the dealer, at the end of the day, I am a licensed automotive service technician. I don't belong to the dealer. So I should have the right to work wherever I want, right? And you don't see that happen in a lot of the other skilled trade industries. When I think about the plumbers, when I think about electricians, you know, even in the professional sector, as a lawyer, as, you know, um, I don't know, even massage therapists, like, 
it's it doesn't happen that way, right? Mm-hmm. And so our our trade is um, not unique, but it just pre- presents different challenges for us. Emily, you've mentioned um, brand pushback. Mm-hmm. Do they have any pet? pet areas that they're using? Um, what we have heard a lot is they will often say that they don't want to release information because of security concerns. And um, I totally appreciate that because I, I get that a lot of it is proprietary um, information and they don't want to get it to the wrong hands. And, you know, we certainly don't want unlicensed or unqualified technicians to to fix vehicles who have no idea what they're doing, right? So I get that. And at the same time, when they say that it's security related, I just think, you know, it's 2023, right? So there's got to be ways. I mean, we have more than enough, you know, fingerprint IDs and face IDs and everything like that, that we could utilize different technology to capture who is accessing this information for what is it being used for. So there's more than enough ways for us to set up systems where we could address the security concerns. Um, And one example that I, and I want to share this example with you because um, I think a lot of consumers don't understand really how deep this goes. Um, And the example I use a lot is Honda. Uh, Currently even, I just checked their website today, it's still happening now. Um, The example I give is that I could have a Honda that requires its PCM to be replaced. So that is the powertrain control module. So the, you know, heart of the whole thing. And um, I can purchase the PCM from the dealer. That's no problem. I can replace it. I have the tools, I have the training. And I can even program the PCM to the vehicle. The last step I need to do, though, is to program this PCM to the anti-theft module of that vehicle. Otherwise, it's going to think it's stolen, right? So that piece I cannot do. If I go to Honda's website, this is from the manufacturer. If I go to Honda's website, it's going to ask me for a vehicle security professional um, certification, which I have. And then in the fine print, it says that it's only available, this this um, anti-theft code is only available for um, American customers. So Canadian and Mexico we, were excluded from this. Um, and at this point, I would have to tow this vehicle back to the dealership to get them to just program that any theft thing. Now, the kicker is, if the vehicle was imported from the U.S., though, then I have access to the code. So as much fanfares are made about security, for some reason, they trust me with an American car, but they don't trust me with, you know, a Canadian or Mexican car. So it's, I think... The reason for that may be some sort of, I'll be gracious and say maybe it's some sort of process, something that's happening there that just, you know, didn't line up. But it just it just points towards how, you know, really, I don't think I, I definitely think there's ways around this security thing to address it appropriately for the manufacturer and to allow the technicians to get the right information and to allow the consumer to get the vehicle fixed where they want it to, to be fixed. Uh, Elena, we're going to flip here. What's encouraging you right now? What looks encouraging to you going forward? What are things that you believe are going to happen? So I I would speak again to the momentum, right? That this, the the momentum is certainly growing. Um, And I think, you know, as a collective, it's our job to continue, you know, building that. I, I, I want people to understand, obviously, that this is um, a significant issue, and, and it will continue to grow if it's not addressed um, you know, now. Um, but like I said, I mean, seeing the momentum that's growing around the world, um, we are all collaborating um, on, you know, what are the what's working well um, and what's not working so well, and you know, we can use those, um, do some jurisdictional. Um, you know, examples, bring those to government and say, look, I've done, I've done your homework, right? <laughs> like we, we know we have all the tools um, and we're going to present it to you um, to make, to make it as easy as possible for them. Right. But having that um, collaboration, that global collaboration, I think goes a very long way. Um, and again, just to go back to what's happening already in Quebec as a start um, in Canada is, is, um, you know, promising and reassuring that they are, recognizing that this is something that needs to be addressed. Um, it is in, you know, our indus- our innovation minister's mandate letter. Um, it was a federal election issue in the last uh, election. And so we have to continue to keep building that, building that up. So that's, uh, that's keeping us, you know, it's, it's keeping us on our toes for sure. But it is, um, it's a promising sign that we are hopefully moving in the right direction. Almost the same question for you, Emily, a little bit different. How do we build an industry that we encourage our kids to participate in? Yeah, great question. Um, for me, there's lots of people who are interested in coming into the skill trade, specifically as automotive service techs. I mean, when you think about, if we really get down to it, right, cars are what kids experience 
very early on in age. And there's always a fascination with that, right? So we're kind of like that introduction to like the skilled trades world for a lot of them. And so I think the interest and the curiosity is there naturally, so to speak. And I think we just get to be better um, together in terms of fostering that curiosity, right? And again, as I said, if I don't have access to the information, though, how can I possibly teach it? Like, so there's just, again, that's another like layered piece about why access to the information is so important for us um, and how that would help us address the labor shortage that we're going to be, mm -hmm. that we're already, I keep saying oh, we're going to come up against it, but let's be honest, it's right here. It's already now. <laughs> Yeah. I like the idea of better together. I think that right. kind of sums up this discussion nicely, which is really good. Yeah. So I'd like to thank Alana Baker and Emily Chung for being on this curbside chat. We're, it's brought to you by AIA Canada. Thank you both so much. Thanks for thank having you. us. Thank you.